uh, Ethereum uh, does all the things that Bitcoin does, in my opinion, uh, much better, uh, more flexibly, uh, because it's more programmable. And now we've got a whole lot of organizations jumping pretty strongly on the bandwagon. And uh, that's going to bode very well for Ethereum. What motivates a lot of people in crypto, I think, is money. Um, and you have a lot of money. Like, what, what motivates you to just day in and day out grind this out? <laughs> hey, folks, you're listening to Empire. This is Jason Yanos from Blockworks. Today, I sat down with Joe Lubin, who is probably most well known for co founding Ethereum, uh, but he's also done a whole suite of other things. He worked in the robotics lab at Princeton for quite a while. He was roommates with Mike Novogratz at Princeton. He helped build a hedge fund. He worked at Goldman Sachs uh, for a little bit. And now he's busy building Consensus, uh, Consensus with a Y, which is building um, basically a suite of products and companies on top of the Ethereum ecosystem. At one point, they had over a thousand employees. So this is a pretty interesting conversation with Joe. Um, before you jump into the episode, if you haven't subscribed to the BlockWorks newsletter, I think you'll really enjoy it. If you enjoy this kind of content, you'll definitely enjoy the newsletter. That's at blockworks.co, blockworks.co forward slash newsletter. And if you haven't yet subscribed on Apple and Spotify, give us a review. And if you're listening on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. So without further ado, let's jump in. Mr. Joe Lubin, uh, it's so nice to have you here. Uh, I have an immense amount of respect for your conviction about how the future will look and and the need for breaking down our current systems. But that feels like a, uh, a heavy topic to jump into right away. So I thought we'd start today. Just let's reminisce for a second. So take take me back to Toronto to actually your your childhood. What was the first time you ever laid hands on a computer? I think it was eighth grade. Uh, so and I'm like 156 years old. So that puts it at eight, eight, this was 1870 18, or something, something like, that. no, it was, it was later than that. Uh, uh, so yeah, eighth grade, junior high school. Um, I was in a, a sort of special math class uh, in that junior high school and they just thought it would be cool to, um, wire up a modem to a black screen, uh, green type, terminal uh, and you would dial up the University of Toronto's computers and you would put the uh, receiver onto this uh, this modem. We weren't really programming, um, but we were uh, sort of, they were gamifying mathematics for us. Uh, and then immediately after that, uh, uh, at my high school, it actually had a, a reasonably sophisticated computer science department for the 1800s uh, and uh, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it was punch cards and um, and there were there was some programming on PCs with the basic I would spend a lot of time at the University of Toronto Computer Center uh, lugging my boxes of punch cards and using the punch card machine and uh, writing really trivial programs that uh, took weeks or months to wow. to work through punch cards that that's old school so were you so eighth grade you're get your hands on this computer or high school you're you've got the punch cards and you're working in basic T we, we actually started we started filling bubbles on cards first and and then um the uh cool sorry the really nerdy kids uh, informed me that uh, we could head over to the university of toronto computer center and, and just use a <laughs> keyboard and, and punch your things were uh were you this nerdy kid? Were you the cool kid? I think in uh, high school, I straddled uh, extreme nerdiness and some social awareness uh, in college too. So I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, extremely uncomfortable, um, but I wasn't uh, a hyper nerd either. So you graduate in 87. My uh, knowledge of web protocols is far less than yours, but web protocols come out in what, 1989, 1990? 89, so, yeah. Tim Berners-Lee okay. wrote, wrote uh, that paper on HTML, or a couple of papers. 
HTML, HTTP in 89. And uh, I was working at Princeton at the time. I um, was doing a lot of read, reading in AI, in uh, neural nets, machine learning. Uh, and I ended up uh, just getting a job. So I essentially hung out in the robotics lab slash uh, computer graphics lab. And I think it was 92, 93, uh, when this this thing, uh, NCSA browser, World Wide Web, uh, was starting to get real traction. So all of my uh, socially capable yet nerdy friends uh, were, were into that stuff. And, and so we, uh, we got excited about it early. Can, can you take us back, actually, to maybe let's call it 1993, World Wide Web, your uh, your cool and nerdy friends start to get a little bit excited. Uh, what like like bring us back into your apartment? Are you what like do you have a computer in front of you? Are you guys all huddled around a big computer? Like what what would it actually look like to access the web back then? I had a a very very large very very heavy silicon graphics machine. Um, uh, we were lucky enough to uh, to have the state of the art um, computer graphics machines, and they were Unix machines. I would either sit in my office by myself or um, much preferably, I would go upstairs to the computer graphics laboratory and, and hang out with uh, uh, my nerdy friends. Uh, and it was uh, um, enjoyable to talk through the day while we were sitting in front of our massive workstations with massive, for the, for the day, massive screens uh, in front of us. We were building um, 3D simulated environments, but the resolution uh, was just weaker uh, because memory and screen real estate in terms of pixels and CPU and GPU power. We were uh, using file transfer protocol to move files around. We were using email. At that point, we were firmly uh, ensconced in the World Wide Web. So, I mean, we were making web pages, and Yahoo was obviously going to dominate the world by indexing the world's information with uh, a whole lot of uh, uh, human effort. People love to make the comparison these days that, you know, crypto is early. A lot of these protocols are still kind of hard to use, and a lot of the applications are kind of hard to use in the same way that. Back then, you know, a web page, you look at a 93, 94 web page, didn't look so didn't look so great. Is that is that a fair comparison to make? It's pretty fair. Um, Netscape added email. And so I think the web, the first web interface that I used uh, to email uh, was probably from Netscape. Um, and so I would go into my office in the morning and I would click to download my email and then I would walk away and go get coffee because uh, it might take a little while. Um, <laughs> so, so that was, uh, uh, all the pieces were there. We were just moving in relative slow motion or lots of the pieces were there. Let's talk about Goldman Sachs because everything I'm hearing right now is you're, you love technology, AI, neural networks, early user of the internet, and then you get a job at the private wealth division of Goldman. doesn't feel like a very Joe Lubin move to me. Um, yeah, it wasn't. Um, I was uh, at a stage in my life where uh, questioning my assumptions was a good thing to do. And it was uh, essentially pretty far from anything that I ever thought I would do. Um, but it was represented as a, an entrepreneurial environment internally, and, and it really was. I learned uh, how big organizations operate. You know, it wasn't... Uh, it was an extended snapshot of that, uh, an understanding of uh, you know office politics where I, I hadn't really played that game very much, and uh, and a real uh, crash course in the world of finance. Um, so it uh, it woke me up uh, to um, a bigger context that I was embedded in that I was kind of ignoring up to that point. Was this? Uh, I guess just to put it bluntly, were you, were you chasing money here? Was this an exciting new opportunity? Like, what is the why, why go into the hedge fund world as kind of a seem like more of a technologist? I guess I'd say. Um, I was kind of on the technology side, um, and I was on the technology side at Goldman. It was basically a friend um, who I'd known for a bunch of years who 
had an opportunity and asked me to help him out on it. And after a couple of weeks of that, he just said, hey, this could work really well and uh, asked me if I would uh, uh, join him in the venture. Awesome. All right, so let's jump forward. So early 2011, you find Bitcoin on Slashdot. Do you have this epiphany moment? Does it take you a while? I had been irritated and concerned and um, to the point of being depressed about the the future prospects of um, the global economy um, based on uh, the excessive debt. And we're way beyond that at this point. I basically felt that instead of uh, demonstrating or complaining uh, or occupying everything uh, that uh, Satoshi pointed a way that we could uh, create a a better foundation, uh, a better trust foundation. I was pretty instantly excited about it um, because we could uh, build an alternate future. And and then when I met Vitalik a small number of years later, um, his vision uh, really crystallized how we could get it done much faster than I anticipated um, based on the Bitcoin technology. You, uh, I want to go off the story a little bit. You mentioned the debt cycle and just debt. Like we're at this the end of this, you know, big, what is it, 70, 80 year debt super cycle, right? And that's how the system's been organized. Are, are you comfortable talking about that and maybe what's wrong with it and maybe how this alternate future might not rely on this crazy debt super cycle? Mm-hmm. So I think there are lots of things right with it and lots of things wrong with it. Um, unfortunately, when you get people in the mix, um, you end up with issues. And if you don't have people in the mix, then you're not uh, building it for anybody and uh, you're not going to be that agile. So it's it's based on uh, demographics. It's based on fractional reserve systems. It's based on political systems. It's based on um, having people in control of the monetary supply that are not serving the best interests of, um, say, stability and um, job creation and inflation management. A system like that could be run well, uh, and it could probably be run well forever. the unfortunate problem is that uh, uh, politicians and money policymakers end up in the same bed. Effectively, too much money uh, will end up getting printed uh, to service selfish needs of uh, either bankers or politicians or or other interests. It's certainly possible uh, to construct a a fractional reserve money system for a nation. Uh, that I think would last way beyond um, super cycle, the 70 year super cycle length. Um, and actually one of the interesting things about Ethereum early on was that uh, you know, we did a lot of talking and thinking about uh, the issuance schedule for Ether. And uh, we pretty much uh, wanted to preserve the ability to issue Um, in perpetuity, uh, just to ensure that we had that lever on security, uh, basically ensuring that uh, there's a block reward. Ideally, uh, as the Federal Reserve attempts to do, we'll be able to match the growth and shrinkage of the economy to uh, money supply, money velocity, etc., more programmatically. And uh, it's really an incredible real live experimental ground for uh, experimental economics. So you so you very much see Ethereum as money. Uh, I see Ether as uh, money in, in many use cases. I see it as fuel in some use cases. And I, I think the nature of money is evolving. Um, so money is a useful abstraction for barter. But we do need a numerator. We need uh, a sort of unifying way to measure things against one another in, in terms of their value. We use things like the US dollar and some people use gold and other people use uh, their own currencies. We may get to the point where we sort of settle on a set of numerators, uh, and I think there'll be baskets. Um, and in that context, it really won't matter um, 
what I use to pay you and what you choose to receive in terms of payment. We'll be able to, our, our intelligent agents in our, in our smart wallets will negotiate that transaction. And if I don't have the tokens that you want to receive, then there will be a, an exchanger in the middle of that. Um, but we do need the numerator. And so I anticipate that uh, there will be um, scholarly work uh, in the future, trying to figure out uh, uh, good ways uh, for things, maybe a, a small handful of measures uh, so that uh, things can be compared to one another with respect to value. So in your vision of this future, it's not that we're using Bitcoin as payment or Ether as payment. It's that you know, the Whatever receiver you can basically so, so it's just, pick, pick I what want, they want. Yeah. I, I want that book on your shelf. Uh, here, Joe, you can have the book. Um, and our agents would hear us saying that uh, and uh, negotiate a, a fair price and transact in whatever tokens uh, uh, I want to get rid of first and you want to receive first. What is, when does this future happen? In the future. <laughs> well said. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well said. So, soon, uh, soon as we can get there. All right. So you mentioned, uh, Joe, the the issuance and that you guys thought a, a pretty hard about this back in you know 2014 or 2013 or whenever it was. Yeah. It's 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 pretty astonishing to me, honestly. Think like looking back, I think there was an eight person founding team with Amir and Mihai and Vitalik and uh, Charles Hoskinson and Gavin Wood. And when you look at companies that are started today, right? That you know crypto companies and more traditional tech startups, right? They usually have two-person founding teams, maybe three-person founding teams. You really never see four-person founding teams. You had an eight-person founding team. How did you handle this? How did you make decisions? Was it messy? Was it smooth? Can you, like, what did that look like? So it was a bunch of people who uh, were magnetized uh, by shared interests uh, into a group that uh, I think was highly functional. Uh, we certainly had interpersonal differences and uh, some comings together and some fallings out. But uh, the vision um, and the implications were so powerful that uh, that we didn't want to break up pretty much. And we all wanted to, to keep moving together in parallel and building uh, our shared vision. Um, and, and there really was a shared vision. There really wasn't much of a sort of open source versus um, VC for profit uh, uh, split um, that's, I think, been overemphasized uh, in recent storytelling. You know, we weren't, none of us went through an interview process. Uh, we all just sort of glommed together and uh, um, came to understand each other and worked reasonably well together, even though some of us had differences of opinions. And I know you're going to ask that question, but I'm not probably not going to answer it. Um, I think the question you didn't want me to ask, which I actually was going to ask, and I'm, I'm still curious about, was it about like you and folks wanting to make it more commercial and Vitalik wanting to go more protocol open? Network? He always had uh, the preference for open source, but he was, he was down for, and we were just figuring it out. We weren't going to go for profit anytime soon. Uh, but uh, one idea was build a foundation that would shepherd uh, the development of this open source project. And then we'll try to figure out how to keep money flowing into the project. There was a moment uh, where we had a small handful of conversations about, uh, about how we explicitly state that direction, but there was never a real opportunity to start doing for profit activities, we all knew that was way out in the future. Um, um, so we were pretty aligned. What's your relationship like with Vitalik these days? Are you guys still in touch? Uh, yeah, of course we're in touch. Um, Consensus and the Ethereum Foundation uh, work closely together on a number of things. Uh, so we uh, we don't go clubbing together, um, uh, but uh, you know, do you, if we do, see do each you other. Go clubbing? Do you go clubbing with anyone, Joe? <laughs> no, nobody goes clubbing anymore. Clubbing is over. <laughs> I remember, uh, what was it, 2018? We used to, everyone used to go to the Bagatelle for uh, Mike and Galaxy Digitals. Like I think it was Thursday yeah. afternoon or Thursday yeah. nights or something. I do miss those days. I think so. I was there once or twice. Um, yeah. yeah. So I mean, when we see each other uh, at events, uh, we talk uh, if 
there's something that pops up, we'll get on a call together. Um, uh, the EF is on the EEA board, uh, so we have touch points there. So we have a bunch of people in our organizations that talk to one another, including me and Vitalik. Got it. Um, I don't want to get too into the consensus layoffs and things like that. I, I, I know several people who worked at consensus and they absolutely loved it. And the folks who work there still, still mm -hmm. love it. I, but I think that one question I had for you is just kind of a fellow founder is, you know, when it came to organizational structure, you did, you, you basically said, all right, here's typical corporate hierarchy. We're doing the exact opposite, right? No reporting, no management structures, at least from my understanding, do you ever, do you ever regret doing things that way to start, or do you think it had to be done that way? Top-down command and control, uh, hierarchical systems have benefits and weaknesses. I didn't want uh, us to get into a rigid hierarchy uh, where uh, information is siloed and, and power is siloed and consolidated. Um, and so it was always about uh, pushing as much um, power and decision-making uh, to where in the periphery um, it was best executed. Uh, so the people doing the daily work uh, have the the best situated awareness and uh, and should be making as many decisions as are possible. Um, but there are coordinative functions uh, that need to happen. And so those people sit higher up in a hierarchy. It can be an information hierarchy. It can be also a decision-making hierarchy. Consensus uh, was formed at a time when uh, essentially there was no ecosystem. Uh, there were no developer tools. Um, and we basically had to figure out uh, how to, we had to figure out how to build smart contract based decentralized applications. And we had to explore the viability of building companies around those things. Um, Many people back then um, felt that it would be too difficult uh, because the code would be out and exposed and somebody would come along and fork your code and knock you off. Um, I and many others argued that there's so much more to uh, an organization than just their code base. And, and there are already some companies that uh, operate on open source. And um, there are predators who who prey on those situations. Uh, so uh, AWS um, does uh, questionable things with uh, other people's open source um, where they're not really contributing back to the community uh, as would be nice. Um, and vampire attacks in our ecosystem are, are a really nice example of, uh, of agility. I, I actually think forking uh, is a superpower uh, for our ecosystem and the next generation economy. Uh, and we should, you know, companies have to survive and protect themselves, but uh, we should evolve uh, into an economy that uh, doesn't focus on um, protection by obfuscation, um, but uh, enables uh, rapid sharing and forking and uh, evolution and derivative works and, uh, and we should all compete by just moving faster um, than each other. And uh, uh, and I think we're getting there. Our ecosystem uh, is a paradigm shift uh, uh, in terms of how things are developed. We started yeah. out being very experimental. Um, we helped open up uh, an ecosystem. Uh, and now, for years now, a, a small number of years, uh, organizations have been flooding into our ecosystem. So uh, we have evolved uh, into an appropriately structured organization um, where we retain a lot of freedom, uh, but we have squeezed out the lack of clarity and lack of accountability uh, that uh, uh, you find in the more freewheeling experimental um, organization that we were living under. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe too personal of a question, but like, can you just walk me through you know, when you realize that you guys had to do these layoffs, like, do you call someone for advice there? Like, do you just do that? Like, how do you make decisions like these? And how do you know how to do something like that? Such a big decision. You guys had 1200 employees, if, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, it 
wasn't uh, done without uh, a whole lot of introspection and discussion uh, amongst uh, uh, people that I trust. While it can be very jarring uh, for the corporate culture and, and for the individuals involved, uh, it is a natural process. Um, as economies expand and economies contract, uh, companies have to um, make decisions um, to either stay alive or or stay uh, strong or agile uh, and uh, ready for the next surge. In retrospect, uh, uh, consensus is very strong right now, and uh, I think we've made good decisions. Yeah. You ever feel like, uh, I don't know, you ever wake up in the morning and see Ethereum, uh, I don't know, $1,600, $1,700, and the community is absolutely thriving right now. Do um, you ever feel like, like, hell yeah, like we made it through this? Like, are you pretty happy these days, or how are you feeling? I'm happy uh, with how things are progressing. Uh, frustrated at how slowly uh, our incredibly quickly evolving ecosystem is building because we, uh, you know, the growing pains are uh, there uh, and that's just a sign of success. Um, uh, there, there was a time in maybe 2012 or 2013 where I lost the concern that Bitcoin would be crushed by uh, well-resourced adversaries uh, into either nothingness or suppressed in the same way that uh, certain forces suppressed the BitTorrent protocol. Um, and I never had that concern for Ethereum. Uh, when, once, once I grew confident that Bitcoin would survive uh, and eventually thrive, and, and I, I didn't know how fast that would happen, um, that was the, the switch for me. Definitely. When does the Michael Saylor moment happen for Ethereum? Um, so I think it kind of kicked in already. I think uh, Michael Saylor did a, an amazing uh, service to the ecosystem uh, and, and certainly uh, to his own organization. I hope it works out really well uh, for, for MicroStrategy um, and for others who follow on. Uh, Novogratz likes to say one and two are interesting, but three is a movement. And now we've got a whole lot of organizations who are uh, um, who are jumping pretty strongly on the bandwagon, and uh, that's going to bode very well for Ethereum. Uh, Ethereum uh, does all the things that Bitcoin does, um, in my opinion, uh, much better, uh, more flexibly, uh, because it's more programmable. We're already building out. Uh, so, so both Bitcoin and Ethereum represent a, a new trust foundation uh, for the planet systems. Um, I single those two out uh, because they are the projects that are most focused on um, optimizing decentralization. Uh, there are certainly other great projects uh, in our space. And um, so at least Ethereum and Bitcoin have a massive head start towards uh, decentralization. And I think our approach uh, will achieve greater decentralization over time. And from decentralization is where you get the trust characteristic, uh, because you, you really don't want to rely on 21 validators uh, in their it's more than one protocol that uh, uh, that implements that, that sort of uh, structure. Um, so I'm really grateful that there are centralized copies of Ethereum or um, smaller versions of their own architecture uh, that are um, drawing attention to our ecosystem and taking up some of the um, the transaction volume that uh, Ethereum isn't handling right now. Um, there are certainly, there's some games, some shenanigans being played where there's uh, uh, maybe some uh, ex, like, uh, inflating of, of the gas fees uh, for strategic reasons uh, and inflating of statistics on, on different networks for strategic reasons. But uh, it, it is really valuable um, while uh, Ethereum gets its shit together. Uh, and that's happening really quickly in terms of uh, many uh, thousands of transactions per second that are getting added to Ethereum layer two uh, quite regularly. Um, 
it, it's great to have these uh, bridges or, or other uh, connectivity to uh, other ecosystems. Uh, I think uh, they will evolve in parallel uh, with Ethereum for, for quite some time. But really, if, you, uh, if you're going to issue digital assets that you hope will get valuable, uh, you don't want to uh, issue them on a, a narrowly controlled platform. If Ethereum succeeded and consensus failed, would that be a success or a failure? It would be a success for Ethereum. Would that be a success for you? Uh, if consensus failed, uh, that would be a failure for consensus. Um, <laughs> and and I, I don't I don't know how that would stack up with all the other things that uh, I've done in my life. Uh, there there are yeah. other things that I've done, Fair including enough. family and, and things. Fair enough. Also, probably more important. Yeah. Um, again, tell me if this is a too personal a question, but you're... It's too maybe personal a question. Can I ask it? Of course. <laughs> the world's... I think I think you might be the world's largest holder of Ethereum. I'm not sure who else would be... That's not more, even true. Like, it, it, it never was okay. true, and it's certainly not true now. Anyways, you own, you own a lot of Ethereum. I guess my question is, like, what motivates a lot of people in crypto, I think, is money. And what motivates a lot of people in general is money, um, and you have a lot of money. I don't, I don't know how much Ethereum you have, but like, what what motivates you to just day in and day out grind this out? I guess having all the people around me um, relatively happy and uh, empowered to do what they want to do, um, and you can expand that to seven point nine billion people on the planet uh, because um, if there are people around me. Um, that are empowered uh, and people around them that are not, then that, that's going to affect us all. Uh, so it's about uh, building better systems for humanity to realize its potential. And and, right, it, think... and it probably takes lots of money uh, to <laughs> be effective in, in doing that. So um, money gets spent pretty regularly on that. Having some money, I'm sure, helps uh, implement change. Uh, we'll we'll wrap this up with a few um, just a few kind of rapid fire questions here. What founder do you admire these days? Kind of simple answer, but uh, uh, the ones that interest me uh, are Steve Jobs. Elon uh, is uh, entertaining and brilliant. They're they're a bunch of great people in our ecosystem. I and uh, I don't I wouldn't single one out over the other. What is your biggest life hack? Biggest life hack. Wow. Is, we can we can turn <laughs> this into a commercial. So it's coffee. super coffee. It's super coffee. It's uh uh it's uh got a uh, brain fuel uh derived from um from coconut oil. Um it's got a little bit of protein. Uh you can drink less coffee uh so it's a little less caffeinated um and i also mix in theanine um which is the amino acid that's sort of the act the other active ingredient ingredient in tea that turns tea from a um a sort of uh jittery potentially aggro coffee experience if it only had uh caffeine uh, into a calm, clear, energized feeling. Any other uh, health tips and tricks that you have going on these days? Uh, sleep very little. Uh, no. <laughs> How much sleep do you get? I, uh, not enough. Um, <laughs> so I used to be healthy. Now I, I work too much. Right there with you. Um, all right, I'll ask you one last question and then you can uh, flip this interview around and ask me one question if you'd like to, uh, to wrap this thing up. You've had a pretty remarkable career, Joe, and have built some things that'll you know, be very impactful for you know, millions of people. What, what, I'm not sure if you've thought about this, but what do you want to be remembered for? I don't care. I mean, That's a good way to, to end it. I, I try <laughs> to do uh, uh, things that... Uh, are really interesting to me uh, and positively impactful. So, and I like it. I'm not all that worried about uh, um, what I'm remembered for. Fair enough. You can uh, flip the interview around, or we could wrap this up now. It's your call. Cool. So, tell me about this podcast that I'm on. 
basically, actually, the backstory of this podcast, I went on a hike with a guy named Pete Rizzo, who built sure. uh, built CoinDesk back in the day. Yeah, and um, Pete's been in the space for a while, right? 2013 or 2014. Tell, tell Pete he, I said hi on your next hike. I will. I'm assuming you know Pete pretty well. And um, basically, he was just sharing all of these fascinating stories of crypto um, and, and Bitcoin it, in just the it, early is days. Is the book coming out at any point? Is he writing all this I down? I think so. I think I so, so soon. Uh, that would be epic. And, and basically, I mean, I was just like, tell me more, tell me more. Um, we did a second loop on the hike just so that he could share more stories. And I just realized like there are so many crypto podcasts and in re researching you for the show, you, I, you've been on like 20 different shows and um, every show talks about your vision for Ethereum and talks about in the institutions are crumbing and, and things like that. But what I'm really curious about is just as a founder in this space is kind of the stories behind the companies and the stories of the founders and like the tough decisions that they've made. Um, and so this, this podcast called empire is basically just detailing and, you know, the stories behind the companies and really the kind of the trials and tribulations that have gone into, uh, just building this new industry. Hence the personal focus that makes sense. Yeah. Hence why I uh, had to ask you one too many, uh, personal questions. So I no, appreciate it's, it's you answering them, Joe. I try uh, not to avoid any questions. So no, they were fine. I appreciate it. Well, Joe, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for uh, being one of the early guests on Empire and uh, wishing you all the, all the best success cool. and uh, a bright future. Thanks, Jason. Good luck with Empire. Wow. Joe has a pretty amazing story. I hope I was able to do it some justice. That was Joe Lubin. This is Jason Yanowitz. If you enjoyed it, let me know. I'm at Jason Yanowitz on Twitter. If you didn't enjoy it, really let me know. If you haven't subscribed to our newsletter yet, head on over to our website, blockworks.co. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the podcast, please do so um, on Apple, Spotify. If you're on YouTube, uh, subscribe to this, give it a little thumbs up, whatever you got to do to um, make sure the, the algorithm gods see this thing. So, all right, I hope you enjoy this one and I'll see you next week.